Hey everybody, it's Brian, and in this episode, we are going to talk about Q objects, signal slots, mock, and the build process. We're going to do this a little bit different than everybody else does it. Almost every video out on the internet says Q object class. The Q object class is the base class of all Q objects, but they don't really explain why or how or how any of this stuff works. So that's what we're really going to dive into. All right, so what is a Q object? Well, according to this, the Q object class is the base class of all Q objects, and that's actually not entirely true. Most classes in Q are Q objects, but there are template class like lists and things like that that do not inherit Q object. Q string, for example, is not a Q object. So when you see this, kind of take it with a grain of salt that not everything is a Q object. Q objects, more appropriately, are the heart of the cute object model. Now, in case you skip that day in C++ land, what is a class? Well, it's a blueprint for an object. It's not the object itself. It's simply the blueprint. Let's say you're going to build a house. You need a blueprint. You need a plan on what you're going to build. And from that blueprint, you can build any number of houses. So that's really what a class is. We're inheriting the cute object, which means we get all the functionality of it. So let's say we're going to build a house but we want a house with a hot tub, right? Because hot tubs are kind of cool. So we would inherit a house and then add a hot tub onto it. And that's basically how inheritance works. A little bit more complex. We're going to cover that later. But when look at Q object, you see it's inherited by a lot of different classes. So the vast majority of Qt uses Q object. And when you scroll down, the first thing they tell you is these functions are thread safe. And then you see connect and disconnect. So this is signals and slots. We're going to touch on that later in this video. And really, we're going to have an entire video on just signals and slots, but we're going to briefly touch on it. Really, Q object comes action packed with the ability to talk to other Q objects. Think about it like this. You have a house, you have a car. As you're pulling the car into the driveway, you want the house to automatically know the car is coming and open the garage door. You can do that kind of stuff with this. It's actually very cool. Now, signals and slots are not a cute centric technology. They just do it really, really well. And scrolling down, you see there's a lot of functionality baked into QObject. We're not going to cover all of this, but just know that it can have children, automatic memory management, signals and slots, which is communicating between objects. You can move them between threads. That means you have multi threaded applications baked right into the core of Qt, and it just gets really, really cool. And again, there are different signals and slots and things of that nature. And we're going to talk about all that in depth in another video. We're going to highlight it here. So first things first, let's go ahead and make a console application. And let's call this Qt6. And this is episode, hmm, what are we on for now, I think? And we're just going to next, 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 default all the way through that. And we're going to build a class. So I'm going to right click, add new and go C++ class, and let's give it a name. Let's just call this test, the infamous test class. Base class, we're going to set this to Q object. You notice how if we do custom, there's nothing checked. We want to make sure this is a Q object, so we're inheriting Q object as our base class. You notice it's also going to check this include Q object and add the Q underscore object. Don't worry about any of this other stuff. Widgets, main window, those are for uh, cute widgets if you're building like a graphical interface and then you got some QML stuff here. Really, you want Q object and Q underscore object. It's done automatically. And it's going to show you the header and the source file. I'm assuming you know what these are. And then the path. And notice how it's going to not add them automatically, but I'm going to copy to the clipboard and let's go ahead and go test.h and test.cpp. So we're going to add those, save our CMake list, and then you'll notice as soon as you save, it scans it. If you get that little green bar, you should see your header and your implementation file. All right. C++ classes 101. Uh, the header is the, well, header. This is what you would include for other things. And then later in an implementation file, this is where you would actually make the functionality. So the premise being you could compile this into some sort of binary, and then you just give your end users the headers and they would include that into their project and then they could compile it into their application using that binary. All right, so we have our include Q object. So we are now going to make our class and inherit Q object. 
And right off the bat, you see this explicit test Q object pointer parent equal null pointer. What is this? Right here is just simply the constructor. We're saying we can optionally add a parent. And when we do this, we're creating what's called a parent child hierarchy. This is something we're going to cover in another video in depth, but it's Qt's way of very simple memory management. So if we were to make a pointer, instead of calling delete ourselves, we just simply make this a child of something else. So we're defining what the parent is. Notice that parent's a cute object. So when that parent is deleted, let's say the parent's on the stack and this is out on the heap, guess what? The parent's going to automatically delete all its children. That's kind of morbid when you say it out loud, the parent's going to delete all of the children, but that's basically what it does. Now, there's some other things going on here too. You see this Q underscore object. We're gonna highlight this and just mouse over it and you see what this does here. It has a defined Q underscore object and a whole bunch of stuff. Basically, this goes into the build process, which we're gonna cover later in this video, but I wanted to highlight that. You're not officially a Q object unless you have this. And this goes into the build process through the meta object compiler, and it'll go through and add a bunch of special code for us. We're gonna cover that later in the video as well. I just wanted to define, you need to have public Q object, this macro in the private section, and at a minimum, you need to have this right here, a parent-child hierarchy. You also have signals, and you can have the public slots. Again, we're gonna cover signals and slots in depth in another video, but we're gonna highlight it here. This is built right into Q object. You have that communication channel between this and other Q objects baked right into Q object. You literally don't have to do anything. It's just there for you to use. The fundamental flaw that Q has is it's very challenging to wrap your head around it at first, but once you understand it, you have that light bulb moment where you're like, Oh my gosh, this is awesome. So you look at the Q object and a lot of things look very foreign to you if you've never worked with Q. You are inheriting Q object. You have this Q object macro, which builds into mock, which we haven't really talked about yet, and then signals and slots. So let's focus on signals and slots. I keep saying we're going to, going to, going to. Let's talk about it a little bit at a high level. So signals and slots are a communication channel between objects. And stop reading right there, because if you go any further, you're gonna see this little meta object system, and then you're gonna click on this, and you're gonna be very confused very quickly, and it's gonna talk about Q object, the Q underscore object macro, and the meta object compiler, or mock, and you're going to really deep dive into what I call the mouth of insanity, because you're not gonna understand any of this at a high level. Because really, at a fundamental level, just to use Q, you don't need to understand that. You just need to know it exists, and it's a thing. So scroll down, and go to this graphic. And this is beautiful. I, I've actually used this to teach people. This is awesome. So you have object one and you have signals and object two has slots. Notice it also has a signal. The point is a signal is a lot like shooting a flare gun up into the sky and saying, hey, this is happening. And you can connect that to a slot to one or more objects. You see how object one is connected to object two and four. So when this signal fires off, this guy is going to see it on this slot. So if you're coming from another language, another framework, think of it like producer consumer or a callback handler or something of that nature. But really under the hood, what we're doing is a signal is emitted and anything that is connected to it can see that event. And that can happen across multiple threads too. So if you ever worked with multi-threaded applications, it's just a complete train wreck trying to send some sort of event handling across thread. Qt does it ridiculously easy. I absolutely love the way it works. So at its core, when you talk about signals and slots, a signal is emitted. So let's go ahead and make a signal here. So I'm gonna say void blows. And a slot would be something that would be called. So I'm going to say void do stuff. And you notice how I'm very bad with my spelling or my indentation, I should say. I don't know why I called it spelling, but we can right click and we can auto indent selection and it beautifies the code for us. I love that feature about the IDE. Now that we've got this, there's some things we need to do. 
So for example, close, you're inclined to, well, implement this because it looks like a function. Right click refractor and you notice there's no option to do anything. You actually don't implement that. It actually is done for you by mock, the meta object compiler, which of course is, we're gonna talk about later, but this is what I mean by you have to understand things to understand things. Right now, take it on a leap of faith. You don't implement that, you just simply define it. A slot, on the other hand, you do have to define. So I'm going to right click, refractor, and then you have some options. We're gonna add the definition inside the implementation file, and it just adds it automatically for us. And in here, we can do something like, let's go ahead and just include QDebug, which I talked about in the previous video. Just allows us to print things out on the screen. I'm gonna say QInfo. It actually does a lot more than that under the hood, but you get my drift. So this looks like a normal function, and it is actually a normal function. This is the beauty of signals and slots. So when you say it is a slot, and you've now modified this to be a slot, you can call this like a normal function, or you can connect it to a signal, and it will automatically fire off for you. This is just ridiculously cool. So what we're going to demonstrate in the next little section here is how to connect all this up and make it do things. But what I wanna do first is I wanna go in here and I wanna to switch to the source and we're gonna show you, we're going to emit that signal. Notice the little icon and let me move off here. It's got like this little Wi-Fi bar on it. That means it's going to be emitted out into the world. Think of it like Wi-Fi, we're just sending some sort of signal. You use the emit keyword to let cute know, hey, this happened. Very important, you really wrap your head around that concept. So this is a slot, but it's also a function, and we are emitting a signal inside of it. All right, quick recap. All we've done so far is we've created a class, we've defined a signal, we've defined a slot, we've implemented the slot, let me switch over. And in our little slot, we are emitting this guy here. So let's make this do something. We're in our main here. Let's go ahead and include this. And we're going to actually close this application. So let's go ahead and include our test class. And then we can say test. Just call it test. And we can actually say test dot do stuff. Now I'm gonna move the mouse off the function here. You see how it's got those little indentations? It's almost like an outlet. That indicates that it's a slot. So a signal has the Wi-Fi bars, a slot has the little outlet indentation. Notice how we're just calling that like a normal function. This is incredibly cool. So I'm going to just run this. And you'll see that, well, absolutely nothing happens when I run this, other than it says doing stuff. We've emitted this signal, but nothing is connected to it yet. So now we need to take that signal, this guy, and we're going to connect it to a slot. We could connect it to this slot, but because it's in there, it's just going to become an infinite loop and eventually Qt's going to attempt to stop us. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this Q core application, this little A variable right here, which also has signals and slots because remember, Q object is the base class of pretty much all Qt objects. So because this is a Q object, we can work with it. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to connect signal and the slot. So I'm going to say Q object, and there's a ton of different ways to do this. We're going to cover it in depth when we get into a signals and slots video. I'm just showing you at a high level some of the functionality of Q object. We're going to say Q object connect, and we need a sender. Then we need a signal, a receiver, slot, and optionally a type. We are going to touch on the type in this video real quick. So the sender, see if I can get rid of that little annoying yellow box there. The sender is what's going to emit the signal. And we need to give it a pointer or an address. So I'm going to say it's our test object. 
And now we need a signal that we are sending. And we're gonna go ahead and say it's from the test class. And we want the closed signal. And the beautiful part here is the IDE smart enough to only show us the signals. So we're gonna take the closed signal. Unfortunately, it does have those little parentheses. It gets a little annoying. Just kill those. Now we need the receiver or the destination. And we're going to say we want the A or the application, which is this Q core application up here. And I'm going to just copy this to save me just a smidge of typing. Then we need to say it's in the Q core application class. And now we need a slot. And uh oh, let's say kill, shut down. No, nope. what is it? Sometimes you can just find it by doing this. Ah, I think it was quit. Let's find out. Yep, there it is. And if you're ever just kind of curious what it is and like you're just having a complete brain fart, you can just scroll through this list and see, oh, that's a signal, that's a signal, that's a signal. There's a whole bunch of signals in here. And I need something that will actually help me close this application. And it's not delete later. Let's just, oh, it must be quit right here. And it's got that little slot icon. Or if you're really, really smart, you can simply select the object, press F1, it'll bring up the help system. And then you can scroll down. And the beautiful thing about the help system is it tells you the slots quit. And then you can take it right there, ask the application to quit. Their documentation is world-class and it actually almost annoys me when people say, but how do I? And then I just literally point them to the documentation. So what we've done here, we've said Q object, go ahead and connect up these two Q objects. So we're connecting test to our application here. We're saying when close is emitted, we're you know sending that signal out, we want to quit. And then we're gonna call test do stuff. Remember, this is a slot, but we can call it like a function. Inside of there, if I right click this, and I follow symbol under cursor, you can see we are emitting close. So when we call do stuff, we're emitting close. And because we're emitting close, Qt is going to call quit in our application. Drum roll. Prepare to be underwhelmed. It doesn't close our application. This is another confusing thing about signals and slots. There's a special way we need to do this. Normally, 99% of the time, this works just fine, but we need that little extra step here. Notice how the default here is auto connection, which tries to figure out what's going on. It does it automatically. It's not working because we're in auto mode. So we need cute, cute connection because guess what? Part of this actually lives off somewhere else and we need to queue it in order for it to work properly. Very confusing that it works that way, but it's just how it is. So I just wanted to throw that out there and we're gonna cover all this in depth in another video. I'm just showing you this is baked into Q object. Let's go ahead and save run. And now this time you see doing stuff and then press return to close this window because we have now closed our application. And if we wanted to, we could get the return value from this guy right here. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna say int value equal exec. Remember exec is just an event loop. We go out here, so you see QCore application exact enters the main event loop, which just keeps that application alive. And I want to return that value, but before I do, real quick, I just want to get a bug, and I'm going to print this out on the screen so we can see what our exit value outside of our event loop was. And this will show you that our application is indeed quitting and it's doing it appropriately. So doing stuff, we emit that signal, the slot consumes it, we close the application down and it says exit value zero, which is exactly what you inspect. Um, exit value is a return code that we give back to the operating system and other applications. Zero is the universal for everything went A-OK. -okay. This worked as expected. If it's something other than zero, it's some sort of error code and we would have to look at the documentation to figure out what that was. So that was actually pretty cool. So a Q object has a lot of functionality baked into it. We can now talk between objects and they don't even have to know the other exists. For example, Q core application had no idea test existed because 
test didn't even exist when QCore application was actually made, the actual class. So we can do a lot of really cool things very quickly, very easily. But how does this happen and why? Let's go ahead and jump out to our hard drive real quick. I'm going to go to the folder that I have our code at. And here's our actual source code. And then here's our build directory. And again, this may be slightly different depending on your operating system, but it all fundamentally boils down to the same darn thing. We have our binary here, and on Windows, this would be like .exe. Um, and then you see this Qt6 autogen. What is this? We jump in there. We have this underscore mock prefs and then mox compilation. What is all this? Well, this is the meta object compiler coming in here and intercepting the build process and doing things and creating. So like if we just crack this open, see how this file is auto-generated, changes will be overwritten, but go ahead and include this guy right here. Oh, huh, okay. Oh, there's the folder. And shockingly, there it is. So let's go ahead and open this up. And this is what Mach is doing in the background. It is auto-generating this code, which connects this stuff. You see, there's our test class. There is our signal, there is a slot, and it's connecting all this stuff up in the background for us, and this is how this works. Highly, highly recommend you don't even try to dive into this and figure out what it's doing, just let Qt do its thing. But this, under the hood, is fundamentally what's going on. The meta object compiler is jumping in and creating all this for us so we don't have to. That is really, really cool. So let's go ahead and look at the standard build process here. So. I'm going to probably explain this very badly because this is not a C++ class. This is me trying to explain Qt's build process. So we have our .h and .cpp files or our source code. And let's just kind of take that on a huge leap of faith that that is our source code and that we've typed it out correctly. This would be your main file, your classes, and all that stuff. From there, what happens is the preprocessor goes in and prepares the code. I think I misspelled preprocessor, that's embarrassing. It prepares the code to be compiled. So it's not actually compiling yet, it's just saying, let's go ahead and figure out what needs to happen for this to be compiled. And at this point, this is where we deviate from the standard C build and cute. I'm going to give that the bright cute color comes in here and mock or the meta object compiler comes in and scans your files and it says okay uh, nope not a q object this is a q object but it's built into cute but i've got this guy up here so let's go over and oh this is a q object so we need to actually convert this c class into a q object and it does all of that mock goodness in the background and then it sees it's got the signals and slots and it does generate all these files and all these things that I just talked about. All that magic happens in the background. And then it comes back up here. And let's go ahead and give this the pretty little build color. Then the compiler comes in and compiles. And then it comes in and, of course, the linker comes in. And the linker goes ahead and it generates our binary, whether it's an executable or a library or something like that. So that, in a nutshell, is probably a very poorly explained version of what Mach is actually doing. But basically, Qt is saying, hey, run Mach, add the Qt goodness into it, and then finish the normal compile process. This is very simple, very elegant, but it can also be very frustrating because sometimes things happen and it blows up and you are presented with you know, this is where it went wrong and you've never seen this code and you can't find it anywhere in the cute source archives. It's because it's code generated by mock. Okay, so let's rewind real quick and let's talk about mock or the meta object compiler. I don't want you to be an expert in this by any means, but let's just kind of rewind here. Remember when I said signals and slots and we go back up here? To ignore this little meta object system link, if we click on this, this is what's going on. So the meta object system is based on three things. The Q object class provides base class. We've talked about that. The Q object macro inside the private section of the class is used to enable meta object features such as dynamic property signals and slots. So you have to have that macro to make all that magic work. And then the meta object compiler supplies each Q object subclass 
our classes with the necessary code. So it generates that code for us in the background. And you can go on to read this, but really at its core, what Qt has done is they are avoiding, you know, without requiring native run type type information through the C++ compiler. So they're making their own meta object or their own typing system. They're creating pretty much in real time their own data types. And this is extremely cool. And you can do a lot of really cool things with it. On top of that, and we're going to talk about casting later on in other videos, they've also added features like you can perform dynamic casts using Q object cast. So now you can dynamically cast one Q object into a completely different type of Q object. This is just awesome. I love this. And of course, you have built in memory management and all that. And then meta information on top of it, which if you're always confused, whenever you hear the word meta, think data about data. So information describing your class and you can put it through some really really cool situations if you're really curious you can deep i mean really deep dive into their documentation through signal slots the property system and the meta object but just know fundamentally at a beginner's level you don't really need to dive into all this you just need to understand that it exists and that it is doing this in the background for you I hope you enjoyed this video. You can find the source code out on github.com. If you need additional help, myself and thousands of other developers are hanging out in the Void Realms Facebook group. This is a large group with lots of developers and we talk about everything technology related, not just the technology that you just watched. And if you want official training, I do develop courses out on udemy.com. This is official classroom style training. If you go out there and the course you're looking for is just simply not there, drop me a note. I'm either working on it or I will actually develop it. I will put a link down below for all three of those. And as always, help me help you. Smash that like and subscribe button. The more popular these videos become, the more I'll create and publish out on YouTube. Thank you for watching.